I want to invite you to take your Bibles, turn to Malachi, the book of Malachi, chapter 1. We're actually going to look toward the end of the chapter, chapter 1, and then into chapter 2. We began this study. Remember, I told you there were six debates in this book. Six. Three chapters, six debates. Now, here's the whole point is, man is debating God, and that just seems really strange, right? Why would man be in a debate with God? But to be honest with you, most of us live our lives, we do debate God. Now, we're not going to say it out loud, <laughs> but we have this battle that's going on. Sometimes it's like, God will hear some prayer, and God says this, and we, well, God, why didn't you answer this prayer? Or, God, why didn't you do this? We have this question and answer going back and forth with God in a, in a debate. We do that in our lives sometimes, even though we won't admit it, but we do that. So that's what's happening in the book of Malachi. There's a debate going on between God and man. Now let me remind you, I, I know who's going, to, who's going to win the debate, okay? But remember we talked about there in chapter 1, the first five verses, that was the first debate. In chapter 1, verse 6 starts the second debate. Read with me, a son honoreth his father and a servant his master. If I then, if then I be father, where is my honor? This is God speaking. And if I be a master, where is my fear? saith the Lord of hosts unto you, O priest that despise my name. And ye say, man speaks, where have we despised your name? Christ, God, is speaking once again. Ye offer polluted bread upon mine altar, and you say, wherein have we polluted thee? And that we say the table of the Lord is contemptible. And if ye offer the blind for the sacrifice, is that not evil? And if ye offer the lame and the sick, is that not evil? Offer it now to thy governor. Will he be pleased with thee? Or accept thy person? Saith the Lord of hosts. And now I pray you, beseech God that he be gracious unto us. This hath been by your means. Will he regard our persons? Saith the Lord of hosts. Who is there even among you that should shut the doors for naught? Neither do we kindle fire on my altar for naught. I have no pleasure in you, saith the Lord of hosts, neither will I accept offerings at your hand. Wow. Now for the children of Israel, that's a, that's a powerful statement by God. I'm not going to accept your offerings. For from the rising of the sun unto the going down of the same, my name shall be great among the Gentiles. Whoa, stop. Israel? He's, this is God's chosen people. And He's saying, wait, my name is going to be great among the Gentiles. And in every place incense shall be offered unto my name, and a pure offering for my name shall be great among the heathen, saith the Lord of hosts. So this is turning Israel upside down. What is happening here? Well, there's three questions that we noticed in verse 6. And probably those three questions are there to trigger our, our thoughts or to trigger our thinking here for a minute. Now let me remember, bring your memory back to just a few things to get you to those questions. Remember the priests were responsible for three things according to the nation of Israel. They were responsible for the education of the people in the law. They were supposed to teach them the law of God. They didn't have books. You couldn't order Torah from Christian book distributors. You understand that. You couldn't end, go on Amazon and find a copy of the law. So the, there again, the priests were responsible for verbally teaching the law of God to the people of God. If they were going to understand it, if they were going to abide by it, it was the priest's responsibility to, to educate them. The second thing they were supposed to do was the administration of the provisions of the law. They carried out the law. If the, if the law said, if you've sinned, you must offer this kind of sacrifice, they, the, the priests were responsible for administering that part of the law. So, let's just say, uh, there was a sin and a person brought an offering to the priest. The priest had to make sure that it fit the criteria for that offering. Was it, was it a lamb without blemish? All those things that fit fit the law, was it the proper sacrifice at the proper time in the proper way, so the, the priest was the one responsible for making sure that was taking place at the proper way at the proper time. 
The third thing that they were responsible for was worship. They were responsible for making sure that worship among the children of Israel, how they came into the presence of God, what they did in the presence of God, and all the things that surrounded that. Music, uh, how people were dressed, all that encompassed worship during that time, the priests were responsible for making sure worship was held in a way that pleased God according to the standard of God. Now let me rock your world just for a moment, some of you. God does have a standard for worship. There's a lot of churches today that think, listen to me, that standard is of the Old Testament, what God laid down is not, does not apply now. Folks, I want you to understand, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and the way you worship God and His standards has not changed. Now, we'll look at some of those probably here in a minute, but I want you to understand, does it matter the way you worship God? Yes, it does. We're going to see that. In fact, I want you to understand, there's going to come a point, if you read the text here clear, where God's looking at what they're doing, and He said, that ain't worship. And you know what? I don't even, I'm not a part of that. I'm not going to honor that. I'm not going to listen to that. Three things they were supposed to do. In each of these three areas, if you notice from the text, the priest had failed. And they deserve the punishment of God. Well, amen, Brother Mark. Punish them preachers. They need some punishment. Get them. Now, I want you to understand, there again, we're in Jewish culture. We're in Jewish, Jewish literature here. So let me understand. I want you to understand the argument that's happening here, the form of the argument. In Jewish writings, the argument was basically made, uh, in debate especially, that if something, let's just say X is something, then why is always greater than that? That's just a form of the argument, and that's what's going on here. So here in this debate, here's look what it says. If a father deserves honor from his son, and a master deserves honor from his servant, surely God deserves honor and respect because He's greater than the father or the master. Now that was, a, that was the form of logic that... Malachi, even God is using here. He's saying what? Now, stop and think about it. In that culture, family was a big deal. So, respect, honor, was something that was very valuable and understood in that culture. So Malachi is basically saying here in this form of the debate, if man, father of a family, deserves and is given honor and respect, Shouldn't God, who created that man, deserve more honor and respect? If a master who has a slave deserves honor and respect from his slave, if that master deserves that respect because he is the master, the owner, if he deserves that respect, doesn't God, who is there again, creator, and the ultimate authority in this world, doesn't he deserve honor and respect? That's, that's the argument that's going on here. So God wants or deserves more respect and honor than any human father because he's the divine father. He's the divine master. In fact, if you read through the Old Testament, over 600 times he's described in that way. The word servant here in our text can mean slave. Remember, the, in the ancient world, a son had no choice but to obey his parents. A slave had no choice but to respect his master. Now, don't get me wrong. Stay with me for a minute. God is not saying that the priest should take a clue from sons and servants how to improve their sensitivity toward God. That's not what He's saying. That somehow or another these servants and sons can teach God something. No, 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 no. That's not what we're doing. But he is stating that their disobedience and not obeying the law of God is something that obviously demands a severe penalty. 
Brother Marl, how do you know that? Well, go back and look there at the end of verse 6. He uses the word name. We have despised thy name. That word's an interesting word in the Scripture. Because the word name there has to do with the, uh, the presence of God. Name is the representative of all who that He is. His, his, his nature, uh, His power, His authority. The word name there, the name of God, Yahweh, Jehovah, we sang about that. There's no other God like Jehovah. It represents the holiness of God, the omnipotence of God, the omniscience of God, everything, the purity of God. So he's saying, listen to me, what you have done when you have disrespected the name, you have disrespected everything that God is. So to disobey that, that is to despise that name or despise God or reject God. Now, that's a pretty serious charge, right? So, verse 6 asks three questions. Look at my questions again. Where is God's honor? Now, let's get into... Now, you know we're going to bring this all home here in just a minute in our personal life. Where is my respect, my fear for God? If He's a holy God, if He's a just God, if He's an omnipotent, all-powerful God, where is my respect, my fear? We're going to look at that in just a minute. So how has man despised the name of God? Now you say, Brother Mark, that's a foolish question because we look in our culture and we know. Now, stay with me for a minute. Because remember, he's not talking to the culture here. He's talking to the church. We, we, we don't have to look very far to see how our culture has despised the name of God, right? Right? That, that, that we don't even need to debate that issue this morning. We can just go through countless times and di different ways that culture, those that don't know Christ, have there again despised the name of God. But the church, how have we despised? The individual Christian, how have I despised the name of God? Because that's what he's addressing here. The priest, and we're a royal priesthood is what Paul told us as believers. We're the royal priesthood, the chosen people of God. Well, the answer starts in verse 7 of our text. You see, they knew the law. It wasn't a question of did they know the law of God. They knew the law of God. So why didn't the offerings that they were accepting meet God's standards? Why didn't the offerings that they were offering to God meet His standard? Well, the obvious answer here, if you read the text, is why? The priests were cutting deals with people. They had forgotten that the offering that people were giving and that they were ultimately giving toward God was more than just a meal. And remember, some of them were shared with the givers and the priest. But the offering was a symbol of one's dedication to God. It was a constantly repeated lesson in the nature of His holiness because they were offering that... Remember why they're offering that get, that offering, that animal. Remember why they're doing it? Because without the shedding of blood, there's not what? Remission of sins. So the constant, every time there was an offering giving and there was a shedding of blood, they were constantly being reminded that God is a holy God and I'm a sinful man. And the wages of sin is what? Death. So every time that sacrifice was given and that animal died, there was a reminder in their minds and in their hearts that God is holy, I'm sinful, and there's a price to be paid for my sins. The shedding of blood was the atonement for sins. We know that it was the precious blood of Christ that was shed for our sins. And that without the shedding of His blood, there is no remission of sin. It was by the blood of Jesus Christ that we stand in God's presence, holy, justified. So the priest knew that. So what was going on? Why were they accepting these offerings that did not meet the standards of God? They knew the importance of them. 
They knew the standard. Probably some of the bribes were accompanying some blemished animals. Remember, it was supposed to be a spotless lamb, a perfect lamb. So probably some of the people were coming and they just kind of offered this blemished lamb and they'd give a little money to the priest and the priest would say, yeah, I'm good. (laughs) Maybe some of the times they were just kind of culling their herd and they were getting worship credit. (laughs) Killing two birds with one stone. When they got to think about it, they were surrounded by the Canaanites probably this time or the Assyrians. Other cultures didn't have to offer perfect sacrifices. They could just bring anything to their God. So why did God, Jehovah, have to be different? Why did Israel have to give the very best? The perfect Lamb of God. Why why did they have to give that to God? Why couldn't they just do like the Canaanites and bring anything? So the priests were saying, yeah, that makes sense, so just bring whatever you want. The priests knew the law. Now stay with me church for a minute, because listen, Malachi was not calling them to something new. He was calling them to be obedient to what they knew already. You see, what had happened was, tradition had replaced the Word of God. Listen to me. Tradition had replaced the Word of God and evolved into a system of worship that had gradually replaced the revealed way God wanted people to worship. Brother Mark, what, stay with Got your Bible? Turn to Mark chapter 4 just for a minute. I'm sorry, Mark chapter 7. Mark chapter 7. Let me show you what Christ said about this. You got your Bible? Mark chapter 7. Look, read with me beginning in verse 6. Mark chapter 7, verse 6. Here's Christ. This is, this is His teaching. You know, remember the book of Mark? It's, it's kind of one of those activity books. He, Mark's been telling people what Christ did over and over. He's just got all kind of great accounts of what Christ did. And all of a sudden, chapter 7, he stops and he says, let me tell you what Jesus said. Hmm. He answered, Jesus, there again, The Pharisees were concerned because the disciples weren't doing some ceremonial washing of their hands. Now remember, this ain't got anything to do with uh, being sanitary or or clean or anything. They They were washing. This had to do with a symbolic washing. They weren't washing the way the Pharisees wanted them to wash their hands. So their question is asked, and Jesus said, When Elias prophesied of you hypocrites, as it is written, the people honors me with their lips, but their what? Heart is far from me. How being in vain do they worship me, teaching of their doctrines the commandments of men. For laying aside the commandment of God, he hold the tradition of men, pots and cups, and many other such things ye do. Then he gave a a couple of examples. Then look at verse 11, I mean verse 12. And you suffer no more the ought for his mother and father, making the word of God of none effect through your tradition which ye have delivered as many such like things. You know what he was saying? He said, hold on Pharisees, you've taken your traditions and you've made them the Word of God. In fact, you put them on top of the Word of God. You see, what we've done in our culture today is we've taken the traditions or the preferences of man and we've placed them above what God desires or what God wants even when it comes to our worship. Brother Mark, boy, that song just made me feel good. Now, I'm not telling you feeling's not a part of worship, but I want you to understand, if that's what we're basing our worship on, we're in trouble. Go back to the text in Malachi. The last part of verse 8 and verse 9. Verse 9 says, As I pray to you, beseech you that God that He will be gracious unto us. There's a warning that's coming out here. The priests knew what they'd done was wrong. The argument was simple. If your governor, that's the last part of verse 8, if your governor wouldn't, would reject this sacrifice, why wouldn't you expect God to? God's not going to let you off the hook. He's not going to let us off the hook. They have willfully sinned, and now they expect God's grace to excuse them for their sin and their punishment. You ever met somebody like that? 
Well, listen to me. God's loving. God's kind. He'll forgive me. Whoa. So you're going to choose to live in sin depending upon the grace and mercy of God. You're choosing to live in sin and then you think somehow or another God's going to be gracious and good enough to forgive that sin when you willfully, knowingly chose to live in sin. Oh, be careful, little Christian, where you go. Follow the text here. There's a warning that begins in verse 10. Verse 10 says what? Who is there even among you that should shut the doors for naught? Neither should you kindle fire on the altar for naught. I have no pleasure in you, saith the Lord of hosts. Neither will I accept any offering at your hand. You know what he's saying there? It would be better to close the temple, the church, than to continue in this false worship that insults God. Wow. That's what he says. The people had fooled themselves into thinking that they had offered God enough that it had earned them God's favor. And the result is what? The curse of rejection. Read verse 11. The worship will not be accepted until things change. Listen to me, folks. You cannot earn the favor of God. So God states His warning in verses 12-14. through 14, And then He gives another curse later in chapter 2, verse 2. In fact, look in chapter 2, verse 2, because He says, your cur- He will curse your blessing. What? He will curse your blessing. Now remember, when you offered the right kind of sacrifice to the priest, and everything was good, and the Lord accepted the offering, the priest then did what? They announced the blessing of God upon you. So if the worship was not, or the sacrifice was not given properly, you never received the blessing. Do you, do you see what's happening here? They began to treat God as a petty God whose laws were bendable and debatable. They were not ashamed anymore to do so little for such a great sovereign God. Folks, think about what's going on in churches today and what's going on in our culture today. The law of God is now debatable. In churches, don't, let's, just don't talk about outside of culture. Let's talk about in churches today. How many times I have been in a debate with someone recently in church, a leader in that church, and I reread the Scripture and they say, well, Brother Mark, that's not what it really means. Hold on a minute. Folks, we're still looking for a standard of truth in this culture. I know where the, I know where the standard's at. Here it is. But what we have done in church now is we're making the law of God debatable. You wouldn't do that in your life, would you? (laughs) Surely not. Thou shalt not lie. You ever been there? Don't, Don't raise your hand in church. Not right now. Phone rings. Wife answers the phone. This you got caller ID, right? It pops up, Brother Mark, on the television screen. I don't want to talk to him. Just tell him I'm not here. Your children are sitting over there in the chair. They're looking at mom. They're looking at dad. Mom says, well, he's not here right now. I'll get him to call you when he comes in. Whoa, stop. Mom and dad both just lied. But that's okay, right? Hold on a minute. What What are the commandments? says, thou shalt not do what? Bear false witness. Stop. Stop. Well, that's debatable because in that time frame, guess what? I really didn't have time to talk. Oops. Well, you know, I know I'm supposed to tithe, but we're saving up for... Well, I I, I know I'm supposed to forgive, but listen, you don't have many times... What are we doing? We're making the law of God debatable now. And if I understand right from Scripture, he says, I don't accept that. See, God would reverse their blessing and make it a curse. 
The blessing was a verbal agreement with the will of God. The priests were basically saying, because you have followed the law of God in agreement with God, here's the blessing on your life. That's all they were doing. So if they had disobeyed His will, that, listen to me, that blessing would be withheld. He would not honor their blessing pronouncements that the priests were making. In fact, if you go back to Numbers chapter 6, verse 24, God gives His blessings, but He also gives those curses. A curse would mean the opposite of a blessing. It would mean God would neglect or disfavor or God would be absent and perhaps miseries that they would face. So sometimes, listen to me, the, this curse or this withholding of blessing was much worse than anything God could do. See, sometimes we look at our lives and we say, well, Brother Mark, things are going along pretty well here. I, I'm doing okay. Health-wise, financially, we're doing okay. Listen to me. You don't know what you're missing out on if you'd be obedient to God. If you would honor God the way He deserves to be honored, no telling what God could be doing in your life. Look at verse 3. The lineage of the priest, he says, are going to end. You'll be humiliated and rejected. They would be disgraced because people would not recognize him as priest anymore. They had violated the covenant. They had failed to carry out their responsibilities. And now the people were suffering. Why? Because the priest had failed. They would be held accountable. You see, the priest, and let me say, dear Christian, once again, that's us. They had lost their fear of God and it was reflected in their worship and their obedience to Him. So my question is, do you fear God today? Hmm. See, it's, 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 sometimes God looks at our lives and He says, it's hard for me to, it's hard for me to really grasp hold that you fear me, that you understand who I am and what I've done by the way you live your life. By the way that you worship, by the way that you witness, by the way that you walk your Christian life, it's hard for me to see that you fear me, you honor me, you respect me. By the way you're living your life. The priests were going to be despised. Now listen to me, folks. If this is not a commentary on the culture and the church, it's an amazing thing. The priests were despised by the culture. The point is that the priests, they were servants and they had no authority to change God's commands or interpret them for their times and their situations. They were not, listen to me, the priests were not supposed to be innovators or adapters. They were supposed to teach the Word of God. What Aaron and his sons had done in Moses' day, the descendants of Aaron were supposed to be doing in Malachi's day. Teach the Word of God. Teach them how to worship. Teach them what was appropriate. In fact, verse 7 of the text reminds the priest in chapter 2 of their important role in society. And listen to me, folks. Dear Christian, look at me. You, we still hold that role in society. This culture will never know about God, learn about God, or know what is truth until Christians start living it out in their lives. Your children are not going to know truth until you live it out. They're not going to understand how to worship God, respect God, fear God, be obedient to God if they don't see it in your life. I had a lady years ago in youth ministry. Her children had come. They'd come to church. They were very faithful. They'd come Wednesday night, Sunday morning, Sunday night. She'd come sit in my office. They were, I don't know, they were older teenagers at that point in time. She said, Brother Mark, the church has failed me. What happened? She said, my girls now, they're, they're living lives that are just, they're, they're not right. They know they're not right. And I stopped and said, let me, let me ask you a question just for a moment. I get them for 45 minutes in Sunday school. I get them for about an hour on Wednesday nights. Sunday night, maybe 20 minutes if I'm good. 
You're telling me I spend less than three hours a week with them and somehow or another it's my fault and they live in your house? You want your kids to know the truth? You want your friends to know the truth? Listen to me. Don't, don't, don't look. Don't. I can teach and preach it all I want to, but if you don't live it, there ain't a thing I can do about it, folks. There were three problems, verse 8 outlines of chapter 2. But you departed out of the way. You have caused many to stumble at the law. You have corrupted the covenant of Levi, saith the Lord of hosts. They have become disobedient. They departed out of the way. They weren't obedient to the law anymore. They led others into sin, which is the worst thing. Because listen, mom and dad, let me say it again. From this pulpit, you have every right you want to to destroy your life, but you have no right to destroy your children's life. You want to throw your life away? Great. Don't destroy theirs. Don't lead other people into sin. Especially your kids. They corrupted the covenant. They were bringing punishment upon the people. Did you catch that? What the Christians were doing, the leadership was doing, was impacting the culture outside of them. Folks, that's what's happening in the church. Because we do not live the truth every day in our life. Listen to me. It's destroying. Don't, don't blame them. They don't know any better. They don't know the truth. You know it. And the reason they're so confused is we've not lived it. And we look at our culture and say, what's happened? I can tell you what's happened. Look inside first. So what happened? <laughs> look at verse 9. God warns them, you're going to be held accountable. Dear church, listen to me. We're not going to get away with this. Individual Christians, listen to me. We're not getting away with this. God's going to hold us accountable. Read verse 9. With Therefore have I made you contemptible in the base of all people according as you have not kept my ways but have been partial in the law. We're going to be held accountable. Now listen to me. I know most of the time we love to come to church and Brother Mark, I want you to preach God loves me. He does. I want you to preach that everything's going to be better. It will be. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing it will be. The only problem is, we've got to live this life here. Well, Brother Mark, I'm a Christian and I'm on my way to heaven. I'm good with God. Me and Jesus, we've got our own thing going. I want you to understand, there's this thing called the judgment seat of Christ. You ever heard of that? You know what the judgment seat of Christ is? That's for Christians who will be held accountable for how we have lived our lives and influenced our culture. We will stand before Christ as Christians and be held accountable for the opportunities, resources, and blessings that we have been given in our lives. I can preach to the culture all you want to out there, but folks, listen to me. As Christ said, it begins with the house of God first. When we change, it'll change. When we change, the culture will change. When we change, our homes will change. When we change, our marriages will change. So have you begun to debate the Word of God? See, a lot of us, we won't say it out loud, but we do it with our actions. Faithfulness? Ah, yeah. You know, where faithfulness used to mean, now it means... You know, where faithfulness... You know, when my parents started going to church, somebody used to ask the question, are you faithful to church? You know what that meant? Are you there Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night? That, that was faithful to church. Now, if you ask people, are you faithful to church? Well, yeah, I go about twice a month. <laughs> really? That's faithful? Yeah, Easter and Christmas. You understand, we began to debate the Word of God, even within the culture, the church culture. Now the question is, do you think that's acceptable to God? No. You think God is pleased with that? Is that the way that we as Christians honor the name of God? By the way, you worship this morning. Did that honor God? 
by the way that you gave, by the way that you sang, the way that you prayed, the way that your attitude when you walked in, did that honor the name of God? Tomorrow when you go to work, how you address your co-workers, will that honor the name of God? When you go home tonight and you speak with your wife or husband or children, is that honoring? The way you respond to them, is that honoring God? The way you serve in the church, is that a way you're is are you honoring God? And some have another we think as Christians that God's going to overlook that. That he's going to be gracious and kind and understand that I was busy, that I had a lot of other things on my plate. I'm here to tell you God demands and deserves our best. Not partial. Not a blemish. But the best we have. Is that what we're offering God today? Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank You. Lord, these are hard sermons for me as a pastor. Because I know so many people give so much of their time, their energy, their effort. But God, it's not my standard that we're looking at today. The, the standard is You. And that standard said, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever should believe in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. That standard that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. That's the standard. The question is, what are we offering you? Not, not just at church. Not, not when we come in this formal time to, to give and to pray and to preach and to sing. But what am I offering God tomorrow when I go to work? What am I offering God in my home to my children? What am I offering God in my community? Am I offering anything at all? Is, is it the best I have? Or is it half-hearted? Is it just casual? Or is it passionate? No reserves. No regrets. Because that's what you demand. That's what you deserve. Is that what I'm offering God today? Lord, speak to our hearts today. I'm going to ask you to stand with your head bowed, your eyes closed. If you don't know this God, I pray that you'll come give Him your life. He gave His Son's life for you. But dear Christian, what are you offering God today? Is it the best? He deserves it. Won't you come as we sing? Won't you come? When the music fades, all is stripped away, and I simply come. What are you offering God today? Wanting just to breathe. All to Jesus I surrender. That will bless all to Him I freely all. give. I'll bring you more than a song. More than a song. For a song in itself is not what you have required. More than a check. You search much deeper. More than an office. Through the way things appear. More than a title. God, I offer you everything. I'm coming back to you. That's what you deserve. That's what you demand. And it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the pain I made. When it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. Put your head bowed just for a minute. Listen, I don't want to drag this out, but stay with me just for a second. You see, what scares me is we've set our own standard in our own life. We're determining what is 
the best. We're, desert, we're determining all that I have. We're determining I have nothing else. Why don't you let God why don't you let God be the judge of that? Just come. Lay it all here. God, it's all yours. We're going to sing that chorus again. I'm going to encourage you. While we sing, won't you come? Won't you come? I'm coming back to the heart of worship. And it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I made. When it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. Our Father, we thank you for the privilege we have to come into your presence. What an amazing thought that we get to worship God. So, Lord, today I pray that you'll give us the strength and understanding we can. Lord, not just at church. But to worship You on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, at work, at home, in the community, when we're shopping, that Lord, our worship, we're offering God You the very best that we have. And Lord, we know if we offer it, God, that You will use it. Lord, help us to be reminded once again, we are accountable, even as the body of Christ, for what You have given to us. It's not ours, we're just stewards. It's yours. So God, help us to be faithful to give it back to you. Lord, to quit debating the will of God and the Word of God. To live that truth out. God, we need you. Help us to know how to worship you. It's in your precious name that we pray. All God's people said,